Look at that incredible view. That's Oregon for you. So nice. Mount Hood looks stunning. Hi everyone. Welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement. As you can see, I'm not in my basement. I'm actually in Bend, Oregon. And why am I here? Well, a few months ago, a viewer reached out to me and said that he had a bunch of old computer equipment and he wanted to donate it to me. And we talked a little bit through email and uh, today was finally the day. Made a road trip out to Bend and uh, we're about to hit the road and head over to his place to get that stuff. But uh, it's kind of exciting. I always love getting fun projects for the channel. Let's head on over. I was told that there would be a dirt road and it was really bumpy, <laughs> especially after the winter. It's a good thing I have a Subaru. I wanted to start with a huge thank you to George for this wonderful donation. This is a picture of me and George at his place before I hit the road home. I drove home with the back of my car filled with stuff and I couldn't wait to dig into it. With everything spread out across my back deck, I was a bit shocked at how much stuff I had actually brought home. Over the next several months, you'll be seeing bits and pieces of George's collection on my channel. But tonight, I wanted to focus on this machine, the Commodore PET 2001. I have an incredible soft spot in my heart for the Commodore PET. This is my PET 4016, something I was able to find locally here in Portland for just $10. The machine was actually in a pretty sad shape, not working but with extensive troubleshooting, which unfortunately I didn't shoot video of while I was working on it, I have an absolutely fantastic looking pet now. This pet was actually originally part of the Portland School District, so this was well loved by students, or maybe hated, I don't know, but used for many years by them. This computer lives here in my office, next to my six core AMD processor machine I use for gaming and working on videos. So it's a little bit of a juxtaposition between this old machine and this very new machine when it comes to the power and changes we've had throughout history. So here's the 2001 PET. This is exactly how it was when I brought it home. George had this stored in his workshop for quite a number of years, but he had owned this computer since back when it was new. The PET 2001 was Commodore's first commercial computer, and it was actually quite successful. Before that, they were making calculators, which is one of the reasons why these keys look a lot like calculator keys. The cassette drive, which is integrated into the computer, is actually some kind of off-the-shelf cassette drive that's just bolted in underneath with a Commodore logo slapped on top. This computer was released in 1977, the same year as the Apple II and the TRS-80 Model 1. But this was the only one of those three computers that had a built-in monitor, which I guess was a big selling point. There's also pretty space-age looking lines, if you ask me. And something that's very interesting is the entire computer is made out of metal. So let's just say it's rather heavy. There's not a whole lot going on on the back of the machine, although it does have some expansion ports. There's a user port, an IEEE 483 disk drive port used for the external pet disk drives, and there's an extra cassette port, even though there is a cassette drive built in. It does support an external one simultaneously with the internal one. The power cord is fixed and is not removable, and I notice here that the fuse holder appears broken. This is a PET 2001-8, which means it has 8K internal memory. There were two options available at the time, a 4K and an 8K, so this is the larger of the two. And the serial number is 27,820. I don't really know how many PET 2001s were sold, but we'll be able to take a look at the date codes on the chips inside to kind of get an idea of when this machine was made. If we take a look at the right side of the machine, there's actually an expansion port right here that I guess allowed some type of expansion modules, but I'm totally unfamiliar if anything was ever manufactured that used this expansion port. Now, one of the coolest things about all the PET computers is you could pop the lid like a hood of a car for service. But unfortunately, I've noticed that the case is a little bit bent right here in the corner. Something's happened to it at some point and that prevents it from easily opening. But I'm still going to open it. I just have to kind of hold the corner here to do it. There we go. And that shows the inside of the machine. Inside the pet, there's actually a kickstand that holds the top up. So we just lower it down like that. And there we go. 
So judging by the amount of dust inside this computer, it hasn't been touched or looked at by a human in quite a long time. Over here on the right edge of the board, it says Pet Main Logic Assembly with a number 32008. I'm always pleased to see that Commodore back then at least used to use sockets on at least a lot of the main chips on the board here. While I own the Pet 4016 and I've repaired it, it uses a much more conventional logic board with DRAM and things like that. But this board uses this RAM here, which is actually static RAM. But worse than that, these are MOS parts, MOS 6550. This is a custom bespoke part that was only ever used, at least commercially, on the Pomodoro PET 2001 series. It's shared for both the main 8K of memory here, and up here there's two more chips. This is the video memory for the computer. In the little bit of research I did, I found that this SRAM isn't really available, because of course they moved on to the newer PET models soon after the 2001, and that meant that these chips, which were only used here, are basically impossible to find. If one of these SRAM chips is bad, I'm going to have to come up with a solution to replace it with a more modern equivalent. From my reading, Commodore went with these bespoke SRAM chips, and actually the ROM chips are also bespoke, because it simplified the decoder logic that you normally need for RAM. These RAM chips have four or five chip select lines, which is a lot more than you would normally have on RAM, which just simplified the way that this was wired up. To use a more modern chip like the 2114, you need an adapter with a L74 logic chip to actually translate those chip select lines into something that chips can use. And the same goes for these ROM sockets. To use a normal EEPROM, if one of these ROMs is bad, I'm going to have to build an adapter board with a 74 logic chip to help translate those lines. Okay, looking close up, let's see if we can see when these chips were made. I'm just going to wipe the dust off of that and wipe the dust off of this. So that has a date code. It just simply says 20 and 78. And this one... It's actually hard to read. I think that says 2478. So that would be 20th week of 1978 and 24th week of 1978. So while this computer came out sometime in 1977, we know that this one was probably manufactured in the middle of 1978 at some point. Now I'm really dying to see if this thing works at all. So I haven't tried it yet, but I think it's about time that I plug it in and give it a test. But I'm going to plug this in and we're going to give it a test. I'm going to run it with the lid open just in case there's a bit of smoke. I can shut it off quickly and see what the hell smoked. So it's plugged in, but remember that the entire fuse socket looks broken. So if I hit the power switch and nothing happens, I'm immediately going to work on that, that fuse and assume that that's the problem. So let's try it. Okay, nothing at all happened. So I'm gonna go and say that that fuse uh, is bad. Let's take a look. Let's take a closer look at it. Okay, before I do anything, actually, I'm gonna clean off this power cord because I keep touching it and it's getting my hands really dirty. So yeah, this this uh, this fuse just appears to be broken. So let's see if I can get this thing apart. Well, that would be why it's not working. I kind of gave this a pull and it's all wedged in there and a piece of glass just fell out. This is clearly just smashed to hell. I don't, I don't really know how this is supposed to come apart. So all I can try to do is just clean out the guts, but this metal is all bent up and yeah, I'm just going to dig at this for a moment. Yeah, all right, I had to take the top off. So the way you take the top off is along the back. Right on this edge here, there are a bunch of screws. You just take those out and then you lift it up. The keyboard is connected, which is like this. Very similar to the Commodore 64 connection, actually. There's a video cable here, which is this cable. That's what brings video. And the power for the monitor is supplied right off the transformer. And that is soldered, so I'll have to cut that in a second and then I'll have to re-solder it later. But for now, I had to take this off because this, this was impossible to get any further. I'm gonna have to uh, remove this cover here and that's where that connection is. So I can try to deal with that fuse holder, maybe install a temporary fuse so I can test this thing. Well, that was a bit of a fail. I got this out. Um, this is the old fuse holder, but this other contact had just been smashed to hell, which is really unfortunate because I went in my parts bin and I found the identical fuse holder right in here. And the way it normally works is you twist like that and you pull it out. 
but unfortunately this part of the contact, which was what this was, was all mangled and I didn't really know how to fix it. So I'm just gonna have to cut this off and I will just solder on this new fuse holder and put it right in and we'll basically have it back to stock. All right, well, that was definitely luck because now I have the correct fuse holder and it's back to looking good again. But checking the fuse that was already in this holder when I found it in my bin, it's one and a half amps at 250 volts. So it's pretty beefy, but uh, it's gonna be more than enough for this computer. Though it looks like a sad pet right now, but this is how I'm gonna try to turn it on. I have the video cable connected, the power to the monitors connected, the keyboard and cassette drive are not connected right now. So let's plug this in and let's see what happens. Okay, I plugged it in, no booms or anything yet, so I guess the power switch is off. Oh, I guess the power switch is on. <laughs> Illegal quantity error. So it's actually working. Oh, that, look at that. We saw that, looked like a, a RAM problem of some kind. Let's uh, see, the monitor is pretty dim. The pot on the back. It's a bit, definitely a bit fuzzy, but it's working. Okay, so what is this error? Why aren't we seeing the, the pet banner? Now, I was watching a video online. I'll put a link to it in the description. It essentially was talking about this exact problem plus some RAM issues. And this problem indicated that one of the ROM chips is dead. And he had this exact same fault. And when he tested each ROM chip, he found that one of them was just reading back as all Fs. And that was the issue. So okay, I'm really excited because this thing just worked unintentionally. I didn't even think the switch was on, but look at that. It's actually, uh, the focus is clearing up a little bit too. This CRT has probably not been used in a long time. Most likely if I plug the keyboard in, I'll probably be able to type on here. So um, why don't I uh, turn this thing off and we'll give that a test. All right, let's try turning this back on now. I guess I forgot that the 2001 models don't have a speaker in them. <laughs> okay, well that's a bit crazy. Nothing is typing, but <laughs> okay, look at that. So there's a letter that's sort of flickering here. The, the R is switching back and forth. So this might not be faulty chips. Maybe it's just really dirty connections and I need to do a good deoxid on the whole thing. Now the keyboard is not typing at all, but if this is anything like later keyboards with the little plungers and those rubber contacts, they just get dirty and they don't type. My original pet, the 4016 you see upstairs, not a single key worked on that when I got that computer. And all I had to do was take the keyboard apart and clean it. It's definitely a little flickery. See all that flickering going on, but it's working. I can't believe that it's working. All right, so that's going to be it for part one. There's going to be a whole series of me restoring this computer and getting it kind of back to looking beautiful again. So keep your eyes peeled for those videos. I, I kind of can't believe that this machine was manufactured when I was just three years old. I mean, look at all this gray hair that I have. I'm in my 40s, and yet it's still working. It's just amazing. So I'm gonna fix this machine up. It's gonna look as good as new. Well, maybe as good as new. There's a few worn bits. I'll probably leave patina, you know, they call it. Anyhow, if you like this video, I'd definitely appreciate a thumbs up. And if you didn't like it, you know what to do. Thumbs down. And subscribe for more videos and, you know, put your comments in the comment section. If you have fond memories of these old pets, I'd love to hear from you. Any other tips, I'd really appreciate as well. And that's it. So thanks for watching. Bye.